It's a cool and rainy night in the railroad junction city of Chattanooga, Tennessee. Union soldiers, their uniforms wet and soaked to the skin. They're sharing the last few rations that they have. Chattanooga, a city under siege, one of the most contested sites of the Civil War. Confederate soldiers surround the city, and Union soldiers are on their last lines of defense. If Chattanooga falls, President Lincoln may never realize his dream of reuniting our nation. Union General Rosecrans realizes that he cannot bring in reinforcements or food by river, by land, or by railroad. The only option for his troops may be starvation or surrender. In Washington, Secretary of War Edwin Stanton presents a plan to the president. His plan is to take the 23,000 troops under the command of General Joseph Hooker for the besieged city of Chattanooga. Hooker's troops are 1,200 miles away from Chattanooga. How can they possibly help? Well, Edwin Stanton's plan is to take them by rail. First take them north, take them west, then take them south through Tennessee, through seven different states. But take them by rail? Railroads are relatively new at this time, and they're unreliable, sometimes even dangerous. One railroad's lines are sometimes miles away from the others. Different tracks are different gauges. One locomotive can't work on the other. How could this plan possibly work? President Lincoln, knowing there's little alternative, orders Secretary Stanton and Colonel D.C. McCollum, the brilliant military strategist who was then in charge of the military railroad, to devise a plan. The next morning, orders were issued to the military. Just nine days later, 25,000 troops, two Army Corps, along with 10 batteries of artillery and 100 carloads of food, ammunition, and medicine, arrive in Chattanooga, Tennessee. This unparalleled military deployment set the stage for the restoration of the United States of America. It also gave dramatic proof of the importance of the use of railroads in combat strategy. There are many interesting but untold stories about the use of railroads during wartime. So I invite you to join me now for a unique opportunity to be a part of history, to go back in a time machine of sorts, to witness firsthand through newsreels, military combat reports, top secret training films, and footage shot right on the battlefield. This is the story of the war trains. 1861, and the Civil War begins. The urban and highly industrial north has a 21,000 mile railroad system. The railroads run in all four directions in a grid-like pattern, linking cities and regions together. The agrarian south has only 9,000 miles of largely unconnected railroads whose primary purpose is to move crops to market. The railroads run east and west, linking the fields to the ports. During the course of the Civil War, the ability of the armies to use these railroads to supply soldiers in the field and to execute mass movements of troops will be critical to success on the battlefield. Organizing the assets of the railroads will take on unprecedented importance. In the 1860s, the typical locomotive is an eight or 10 wheeled wood burner weighing about 55,000 pounds. It has 60 inch drivers and can pull a light train at up to 60 miles per hour. Passenger coaches Box cars and flat cars use handbrakes and Lincoln pin couplings, but otherwise are configured much as they are today. The strategic use of this simple equipment will prove to be a decisive factor in determining the outcome of the war. President Abraham Lincoln, a former railroad lawyer, knows that the railroads will be an invaluable means of transporting troops and the trains will serve as the chief means of supply for the Northern Army. The president uses his emergency powers to place the nation's railroads under military control. Lincoln appoints Colonel D.C. McCollum as military director and superintendent of railroads in the United States, giving birth to the United States military railroad system. McCollum knows that absolute control of the rail lines, rolling stock, tracks, and bridges is essential. Nothing must be wasted and losses must be kept to an absolute minimum. In combat areas, troops are assigned to guard and protect the railroad bridges. Time and again, railroad junctions become the strategic objectives 
of major battles. In the South, though no singular railroad strategist emerges, the Confederate Army employs the railroads for long-distance movement of troops. Railroads enable troops to be moved longer distances in much less time. In one remarkable example of troop deployment, the Confederate Army uses trains to move its infantry with numerous transfers 900 miles by rail in less time than it takes its cavalry to travel 275 miles on horseback. In the north, McCollum's chief deputy in the field is Herman Hopp, the ceaselessly inventive engineer in charge of construction and repair. Hopt is a master, both of using the existing railroad and building whatever is needed to support the Army. He proves his skills dramatically by reconstructing the Potomac Creek Railroad trestle after it is reduced to a pile of rubble and broken stone piers by rebel saboteurs. Under Hopp's direction, the ruined bridge, which took an entire year to build, is rebuilt out of raw wood with unskilled labor in just nine days. President Lincoln comments, that man hopped has built a bridge across the Potomac Creek about 400 feet long and nearly 100 feet high, over which loaded trains are running every hour. And upon my word, gentlemen, there is nothing in it but bean poles and corn stalks. For the next hundred years, throughout the course of trains and warfare, soldier railroaders will accomplish similar marvels. The year is 1941. In seven months, America will enter World War II. The military railway service is reactivated. Thousands of men are being trained how to build, repair, and operate military railway systems for duty overseas. Here in the United States, a special military railway system is being built to act as a proving ground for the thousands of Americans who will be working in the railway operating battalions. gigantic military railroad program in history focuses new interest on Camp Claiborne, pride of the Army Transportation Corps. Railroad operating battalions are trained for the major function of keeping the iron horse rolling in overseas theaters of operations. It's part of the long-range plan to solve the vital problem of transporting troops and supplies in pace with the fast-moving Allied offensives on world battlefronts. The activities of these soldiers of the railroad may be partially overlooked. You might even put them into the classification of unsung heroes. But by any name, you're sure to meet up with them somewhere, helping you and your equipment to reach their assigned destinations, safely and in a hurry. Trained to their particular jobs, just as you're trained to handle the gun, the tank, or jeep, they have been made to be ready for real assignments, and they can be found where the fire of battle is at a white heat. For an effective illustration, we move to the North African battle scene, where Army railroad workers wrote heroic chapters during the hectic six-month campaign. Locomotives and rolling stock had to be serviced 24 hours a day. Strategic rail sections destroyed by the enemy had to be rebuilt almost overnight. Lines to Tunis and Bazaar had to be opened and operated. The logistics of the campaign put extra heavy emphasis on railway links. The assignment was overwhelming. The time was short, but the men of the railroad battalions knew their jobs. Equipment long lacking proper maintenance was given new efficiency. Military railroad traffic at the front increased in carload tonnage. And when the Allied commanders took final accounting of the contributing factors to victory in North Africa, the railroad troops were not forgotten. At this point, the training of these men should again be mentioned. Railroad operating battalions for every front, drilled in the manner to be illustrated in the balance of this film. We've returned to Camp Claiborne and are following the soldier railroad students into the classrooms where the fundamentals of railroad work are expounded. Telegraphy is always essential. The teaching method includes the sending of messages by the instructor, which the students receive by ear and then record on paper. Officers at Camp Claiborne are experienced railroad men, recruited from the nation's major railroads. 
Actual railroad experience is also looked for among enlisted personnel, with many old-timers in the ranks. Now, an interesting training feature, the step-by-step -step procedure of getting an Army railroad line into action. First, the chief dispatcher prepares the order for the makeup of a train, as required by the particular situation. A copy of the order is passed on to the dispatcher, whose responsibility it is to call the orderly room for the necessary train crew. In quick order, the men are on their way. The yard master gives orders to the yard foreman for making up the special train. The yard engine the foreman is starting off will be utilized for the purpose of building up the train, beginning with the caboose. Now the job is for the switchman to close the siding from which the engine picked up the caboose and open the siding on which the train will be built up. And before long, the train is completely built up. Each car will serve a definite purpose. They detach the yard engine, and Mr. Iron Horse himself proudly struts out of the roundhouse. The coupling of the engine to the completed train is the next step. Ready to roll. But first, there are a few details. The conductor checks his watch against the master clock in the yardmaster's office, and signs the outgoing train register. Then he receives his orders. The engineer also gets the orders. Meanwhile, the rear brakeman climbs aboard the caboose and hangs out the rear lamp. All hands now wear helmets, gas masks, and pistols. All aboard! The military railroad at Camp Claiborne in operation. The line itself is a 50-mile run between Claiborne and Camp Hope. Government built, owned, and operated, it was originally designed for the sole purpose of training railroad operating battalions. However, it has since served as a valuable transportation link between the two camps for the movement of troops and supplies. Along the line, the train makes a water stop. Every operation of the Army Railroad has been worked out to take the minimum amount of time. eight stations between Claiborne and Polk, and the telegraph operators deliver orders on the run to the engineer and the conductor. Following the policy of advanced unit training, the Army Transportation Corps conducts training under mock combat conditions. America is at war solving military transportation problems unique in world history. During 1942, the very first year of the war, the railroads will put forth the greatest voluntary cooperative effort ever seen by private industry working in tandem with the military and our government. 72% of all freight carried in this country will be done by the railroad. The railroads will move raw materials to factories, troops to training camps, food to population centers. In fact, during 1943 alone, the railroad will move four and one-half times more army freight than during all of World War I. Because of the billions of dollars spent since World War I to improve all aspects of the railroad systems, including the standardization of equipment and procedures, the railroads are able to avoid the government takeover that occurred during the Civil War and World War I. Instead, Movement of both troops and vital materials for military and civilian use are coordinated by the Association of American Railroads and the government's Office of Defense Transportation. This teamwork leads to historic accomplishments. When the threat of enemy submarine attacks stops commercial shipping through the Panama Canal and along the Atlantic coast, it will be the railroads that fill the void, 
including the transport of nearly a million barrels of oil a day from the southwestern United States to the major cities of the East Coast. The railroads will find creative solutions to these difficult transportation problems. But some problems are just bigger than others. Like, for instance, how would you move a Navy ship a thousand miles across land? Leave it to the railroad to provide the answer. Here is one railroad's innovative way for a half dozen iron and steel contractors in Denver, Colorado to become shipbuilders. In the home yard of the Union Pacific Railroad in Denver, cars carrying locally manufactured sections of a U.S. Navy landing craft are dispatched. The heavy train starts its long trip to the coast with the sections of the landing craft braced for the rough journey ahead. A locomotive needs at least four times more power to pull a train uphill, so a helper engine is added to push the train up the steep grades of the high mountains. The train, laden to capacity, moves on across the rolling plains, eventually reaching the San Francisco Navy Yard. The cars are moved to the assembly ways. The bracing is cast loose and the train is unloaded. Now the sections of the landing craft are assembled on an inclined track. Rolling down the assembly line, the sections are fitted together and a hull grows into a ship. After a shakedown cruise to tester systems, the landing craft will be delivered to a combat operations area on top of a larger LST transport ship from which the landing craft will be launched. From plates of inanimate steel manufactured in the towering Rockies, a living, breathing fighting machine is ready to storm ashore in Japan. Its journey began on the railroad. During World War II, 90% of military cargo and 97% of military personnel were transported to war by rail from their homes to their training camps to the ports of embarkation. In cars just like this, 44 million men went to war. Imagine this, if we were to transport the same amount of people by automobile, we would have to load a car every 10 seconds, 24 hours a day for four years. And we still wouldn't have moved our equipment. Speeding the machines of war, trucks, motors, tanks, from supply depots inland to ship convoys waiting at seaports, is the war job of America's vast network of 45 great railway systems. Moving an infantry division with full armored equipment requires 65 complete trains more than 1,350 flat cars and coaches. Army engineers, skilled in the complex problems of supply, supervise the loading. Not a moment is lost. Not a square foot of space is wasted. Equipment loaded and lashed down for the trip, troops go aboard. In this way, millions of men of the armed forces were carried by American railways in the first 10 months of the war. From traffic control towers, 
railway dispatchers operate fleets of troop and passenger trains over a half million miles of track. On every line, troop trains have the right of way. Speed is the watchword. Army cooks set up their commissary departments en route. There's no stopping as fresh troops and supplies are sped across the continent day and night. At embarkation ports, ship captains await the arrival of their war cargoes. And dawn finds the railways delivering the goods on scheduled time. Week after week, these veterans of the throttle are rushing more and more troops to swell the rising tide of armed forces being sent overseas. That the convoys may sail on schedule, American railways are playing an important part in helping the United Nations win the war. It is January of 1951. At a railroad station in Busan, South Korea, young men ready for war board the trains. With railroad lines running up to the rear areas of infantry divisions, some of these men will be carried all the way to their divisions by rail. Along the way, they will pass the military supply dumps where every day trains will be loaded with 600 tons of supplies to be delivered to each division. They will also pass hospital trains evacuating the wounded to the mobile army surgical hospitals, the famed MASH units. It is October of 1918 at a railroad station in France. The men of the 26th Division board a troop train on the way to the front. They know that their brothers in arms, the soldier railroaders, will work to keep them supplied with the munitions and equipment necessary to win the battles that are before them. Brakemen wait on top of the cars, ready to take their positions when the train rolls out of the station. The soldiers pass through the French landscape on the war train. So many lives have been disrupted. So many people find themselves pressed into unfamiliar roles. With their husbands at the front, women now operate the railroad crossings. So much has changed since the days of peace were disturbed by the years of conflict. But the war train continues down its iron road. Across the years, across the generations, across the scenes of conflict, the war train rolls on. The railroad is at the heart of the strategy that will allow these men to be successful in combat. But many battles are before them. Good luck and Godspeed. The year is 1917. For three years now, Europe has been involved in a devastating conflict between the German Central Powers and France and England. The United States has remained neutral. Germany is attempting an alliance with Mexico, threatening the entire southern border. But the final straw is when a German submarine sinks an American ocean liner. 
bringing the United States into the war. President Woodrow Wilson signs a declaration of war saying, the world must be made safe for democracy. March 1918, we're in the port city of Saint-Nazaire, France, where a vital railroad link runs inland to Paris. Here, the United States military has set up several railway battalions. At home, President Wilson has seized control of the railway systems, which have fallen into disarray since the boom times of profit and achievement at the turn of the 20th century. He formed the United States Railway Administration, which sets new standards for design and production. These standards will lead to unprecedented levels of efficiency and production, both in military factories and in military railway battalions abroad. In the battlefields of Europe, this conflict has become a war of attrition. Railroads can bring reinforcements to the front lines much faster than infantry troops can advance across fields of trenches, barbed wire and mud. In this war, once again, the goal of the armies will be to take advantage of the railroad speed in mobilizing troops. The military railway service, a branch of the United States Army Corps of Engineers, has been sent to France. There are 20 military railway operating regiments, six maintenance of way regiments, eight car regiments, and 12 locomotive shop regiments here to construct, repair, and operate the railroads. The cars being assembled here are manufactured by the Standard Steel Car Company. Arriving in crates containing a jigsaw puzzle of parts, the assembled cars will carry trucks and tanks, provide housing for the men who work with the field artillery, carry ammunition to the front, and contain portable kitchens and field hospitals. In cars such as these, nearly four and one half million gross tons of supplies will be transported to the fighting front, reaching a peak in October 1918 of over 8,000 tons per day. These are steel ammunition cars, which will be used to haul shells and powder bags for a variety of heavy railway artillery, including the United States Navy's 14-inch 50 caliber railway gun. Four-wheeled trucks are placed on the rails and the cars are built directly on top of them. This is done for efficiency because when the last rivet is in place, the cars are already on the track and ready to roll. Steel reinforced sides and roof supports are mounted on the car's frame and riveted into place. Some of these ammunition cars will accompany the Navy's 14-inch railway guns. Between the first shot fired on September 6th through the armistice on November 11th, the Navy's heavy railway artillery will fire 782 rounds of 1,400-pound shells at a distance of 17 to 22 miles. Locomotives built to the American standard will supplement the narrow gauge lines in use for frontline traffic in France. The locomotives are also shipped here in pieces and assembled by American soldiers.
Baldwin Locomotive Works of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, is devoting its entire manufacturing capacity to the construction of railroad equipment for the war. It builds the Iron Warrior, the standard gauge steam locomotive, which will be used for high-speed, long-distance, large-capacity transport. Baldwin will also construct narrow-gauge locomotives and rolling stock, as well as manufacture a total of six and a half million artillery shells. The name Baldwin has been associated with railroads in combat since the Civil War, when the company introduced a standardized system of interchangeable parts. Baldwin began to develop standardized gauges during the war between the states and had perfected a set of master gauges by the 1890s. During World War I, all parts with machine surfaces are accurately fitted to these master gauges. The Baldwin locomotives assembled here in Saint-Nazaire are consolidation type engines with a 280 wheel configuration, 21 by 28 inch cylinders and 56 inch driving wheels. The engine has 35,600 pounds of tractive effort and weighs in at 166,400 pounds. That's 83.2 tons. More than two and a half times the weight of Baldwin's Civil War locomotives. Here the locomotive's frame is lowered onto its wheels, which are already in place on their axles. The large wheel size indicates that the locomotive is intended for high-speed running over long distances. These men are at work on the cylinders and valve gears. Steam entering the cylinder forces the piston backwards, moving the drive shaft and causing the wheels to turn. At the heart of the Baldwin steam locomotive is its boiler. The boiler barrels are made up of circular steel rings. The semicircular section attaches to the firebox. Boiler tubes run through the boiler from the firebox to the smoke box. These tubes carry the heat of the fire through the water in the boiler and then exhaust the smoke out through the stack. The boiler is placed on its frame. Careful placement is essential, both for proper distribution of weight and for a correct alignment of engine components, such as the firebox's damper doors. The smoke box is at the front end of the locomotive. The smoke box has a hinged door, which is airtight when secured. Controlled airflow comes through the blast pipe of the smoke box, increasing the heat of the fire and expelling the combustion gases. The locomotives are now in the final stages of assembly. From a jumble of parts that arrived in crates at the docks of San Nazaire, the Baldwin locomotive is ready to roll down the road to war. Each completed locomotive is the result of the dedication and ceaseless efforts of dozens of soldier railroaders. The premier accomplishment of the railroads during World War I will be the standardization of equipment and the acceleration of production. By manufacturing these interchangeable parts, the cost of production will decrease substantially and the speed of repair and assembly will increase dramatically. 
The first engine built by Baldwin for use in Europe takes 20 days to complete. But by the end of the war, at the height of their capacity, Baldwin will build 300 war locomotives a month. Nineteen forty four, Quebec, Canada. The war train delivers English Prime Minister Winston Churchill to a meeting with American President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. In this latest of a series of conferences to discuss war strategies, Roosevelt and Churchill will talk about the results of the coordinated Allied war effort. Also on the agenda is a discussion of the transportation of munitions to Russia as they continue their attempts to break down German defenses on the Russian front. Carrying a load of supplies for Russia, a United States Army train pulls into Tehran, Iran, for special ceremonies honoring the sending of huge tonnages of war materiel to Russia. American General Theodore Osborne of the Persian Gulf Command breaks a bottle of vodka over the powerful diesel locomotive. Through the rugged Iranian countryside, over great plains and high mountains on the Iran to Russia route, vast quantities of American-made weapons and supplies of war have been delivered to the Russian ally. The freight yards of Tehran are a vital junction between the American and Russian war machines. In formal ceremonies, High officers of the American and Russian armies pay tribute to work performed by the men and women of their commands. The special train comes in, now drawn by a Russian locomotive with Russian personnel. Major General Donald H. Connolly, commanding general of the Persian Gulf Command, officially turns the cargo over to the commander of Soviet forces in Iran General Ivan Kargan. The train's flags are transferred from American to Russian Guards of Honor. General Connolly congratulates the Russian girl firemen Valentina Vervahova, a veteran of this vital railroad route, which has played an invaluable role in supporting and supplying the great Russian offensives. Nineteen forty four. The war train rolls into Berlin, delivering Adolf Hitler's military leaders to an audience with a German dictator. Hitler's goal of world conquest beginning with the total domination of Europe, has begun to unravel on all fronts. Hitler's expansionism reflects a renewed German nationalism. Hitler was a soldier in World War I, when German militarism was a principal cause of the breach of world peace. In both wars, a determined Allied response crushes Germany's threat to freedom. It's November of 1917, and the German army has occupied many regions of France, in preparation for their occupation and capture of Paris, the German army moves up heavy artillery, capable of firing 25 miles. Now the Allies and the United States have no guns of this size that can fire that far. As a matter of fact, guns of this size are virtually non-existent in the continental United States. But they do have guns of this size on United States Navy ships. And the decision is made at this time to put Navy guns on railway mounts. 
Now in July of 1918, components for the Navy guns and their artillery trains arrive in San Nazaire. Here the American military is building the answer to Germany's firepower. Because gun design had been revolutionized at the turn of the century, many armies, including the French and the Americans, find themselves short of modern equipment during World War I. Heavy railway artillery is an answer to the shortage of firepower. These mounted railway guns are built by Baldwin Locomotive Works, which also manufactures six and a half million shells for all types of artillery. Before the armistice, Baldwin will build 11 railway guns. Five go to the Navy. The other six will go to the Army. Though there are distinct individual differences, the mounting for most heavy railway artillery is similar in design. It consists of steel plates attached to two side girders joined together by cross braces. This framework is supported upon two front and two rear six-wheel bogies, a grouping of wheels. The gun features a fast-loading screw-type breech. The 14-inch artillery's gun, cradle, and recoil system are largely Navy standard patterns, allowing the weapon to fire shells weighing 1,400 pounds, a maximum range of 42,000 yards, or 23.9 miles. Each artillery battery is made up into a train consisting of a locomotive, a gun car, ammunition cars, a workshop car, and cars for construction, berthing, and kitchen use. Fittings are checked carefully, and the final steps in the preparation of the gun include paint and polish. Notice that unlike other heavy railway artillery, the design for the Navy 14-inch gun features an enclosed body which covers the breech end. Here Franklin Delano Roosevelt, in civilian clothes, confers with Rear Admiral C.P. Plunkett. Roosevelt, the 36-year-old Assistant Secretary of the Navy, strides alongside Admiral Plunkett for a tour of inspection before the gun leaves for the front. This weapon will be invaluable in the field against German positions. Even in the American railroad yard, it is guarded around the clock. These are the officers and the men of the United States Naval Railway Battery, whose work on these guns will help to win the war. Here in France, 60 centimeter narrow gauge track is being used by the railroads for logistical supply. In the United States, Factories producing supplies for the railroads are geared up to produce standard gauge equipment. So standard gauge tracks are used here in France to transport men and equipment longer distances at higher speeds. Narrow gauge track and equipment, already in place in France, is used for low speed transport on low grade roads. Since French military railway bridges and tunnels are already laid with narrow gauge equipment, this gauge is extended forward to the front lines. The track is laid quickly in areas where it can follow natural grades, avoiding cuts and fills. Long in use in mines, quarries, and industrial areas, narrow gauge track is less costly and lighter weight than standard gauge track. Train load after train load of raw materials are brought to the places where new rail lines will be built. This includes wooden ties and steel ties, rails of iron or steel, and prefabricated track. The men are well trained in the procedures to follow to lay new track efficiently and expeditiously. The narrow gauge track reaches forward to the battle lines from supply dumps on standard gauge lines. More than 13,000 U.S. Army troops are engaged in the construction and operation of these light railways. From the men who survey the land to the troops who lay the ties, these railroad soldiers are building rail links that will play an invaluable role in delivering supplies to Americans fighting at the front. There is a precision in their movements and a plan to be followed.
They lay ties to build a spur for the quartermaster warehouse. They lay steel rails that will be the lifeline, conveying ammunition and supplies to the First Army. They haul rock to study the line running into newly captured territory. The roadbeds require a ballast of gravel. Cinders are crushed stone to stabilize the track. From American-operated quarries, gondola cars are filled with crushed rock for use as ballast. Barges also haul ballast for the roadbeds. The filled gondola cars are taken directly to the site of track construction and unloaded. Soon the men marching to the front will be able to be transported there by rail. These railroad soldiers will build or repair more than 300 miles of narrow gauge railroad track. On this track, more than 860,000 gross tons of supplies, up to 8,100 tons in a single day, will be rushed to the front. These men who fight with ties and rails play a role as important to the war effort as those who fight with rifles. These are the men of the American Expeditionary Force Division of Light Railways and Roads, and they are called the 301st Military Railway Service, the 21st Light Railway Engineers, the 528th Engineers Service Battalion, Colored Troops, the 1st Pioneer Infantry. Both narrow gauge and standard gauge rail lines are essential to the success of an army at war. These railroads will become the roads to peace. Another track is completed and another war train rolls on. If the railroad is the lifeblood of transportation to the battlefront, the trench engine is its muscle. These small but powerful armored engines are used on the narrow gauge railways for hauling munitions and supplies. Built by American troops in France, trench engines have lower profiles than standard gauge road engines, as well as armored reinforced bodies. Supply dumps, which store an army's munitions and rations, are often on standard gauge railroads located at a distance from the front lines, in areas that are relatively secure from enemy attack and takeover. These supply depots are located at railheads where standard gauge railroads and narrow gauge railroads meet. The transfer of men and materials from one gauge of equipment to the other are made at these railheads. Here the trench engine, with its train of rations and supplies, begins its journey to the front lines, 
through the fields and villages of war-torn France. It is cheered on by men who have labored in the name of liberty, by men who know the dangers that are found along the Iron Road. The war train passes infantry and cavalry troops protecting a recently recaptured village. The front is less than five miles away, but life goes on in this village, caught between the memory of tranquility and the presence of conflict. One month ago at Chateau Terry, troops of the U.S. 2nd Division stopped the German advance on Paris. Now, on the eve of the 4th of July, 1918, these American troops in France transferred to a narrow gauge rail line on their way to combat. They are far from home and the fireworks they are soon to encounter are of the lethal variety. Though we do not know their names, we will remember their faces. The trench engine approaches the front lines. One mile away, the Allied troops are preparing an assault on German strongholds. The soldiers of the Iron Rail have completed their mission, bringing food, equipment, supplies, and medicine all the way to the fighting front. This is not a machine. It is the handiwork of freedom. This is the love of liberty made manifest, the tradition of working together for the common good, the legacy of pride in country, and the courage to sacrifice to preserve freedom. This is the railroad, and these are the war trains. The road ahead will bring the trials of war, but in the hearts of these men, a simple dream lives on. It is a dream of the day that the railroad will carry them back home, back to the blessings of peace. So may God bless the railroad, and may God bless the soldiers of the Iron Road. <laughs>